justice lineage call me as those calls of old have sung. It came a flowered bride amid the cold of winter when has spent The Craplet Christmas Extravaganza, the eighth day before Christmas. The eighth day of Christmas comes after Christmas, on the way to Epiphany. If you're just tuning in to the Craplet Extravaganza for this Christmas season 2015, you should know that there are seven days worth of audio already waiting for you over at craftlet.com or at our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash craftlet dash channel. Well, today I have a surprise for you that some of you will be very excited about because you have probably read works by this author before. Her name is Edith Nesbitt, and she's an incredibly popular children's author still. However, she's not as popular in the United States as she was overseas. And part of that may be because she was British. But part of the reason that I say that is because she was an enormous influence on all sorts of British authors. P.L. Travers, who wrote Mary Poppins, Edward Eager. He is interesting all on his own. But Edith Nesbitt, our author today, also influenced people like C.S. Lewis and J.K. Rowling. And I think you'll see how part of Nesbitt's influence resonates in J.K. Rowling. Because in a time, specifically the end of the 19th century and the turn into the 20th century, uh, in that time, as we've already heard during our our Christmas audio, a lot of the audio that was aimed at children was uh, fairly, I don't want to use the word treacly, but that's certainly the one that comes to mind first, wrapped up in an adult vision of what a child's life was like. And actually, one of the pieces of audio that I'm not playing for you is a a fairly down essay that Charles Dickens wrote on what Christmas becomes as you become older. And it was it was not the happiest essay. I was kind of looking forward to it and went, oh, wow, no, I'm not going to play that. Yikes. It's on LibriVox if you want to read it. But wah. So Dickens kind of took it to the extreme with that one. Nesbitt places her children firmly in real life. A lot of the time, the children are living in families where finances are difficult, where the struggles that they or their family are facing are serious. Uh, The stakes are pretty high as far as just, you know, being a family, staying a family, surviving, eating, all of that kind of thing. But she doesn't do it in a Dickensian way. She's not writing melodrama. And that's one of the things that's so interesting about her because her, her characters really feel quite modern. And before I I mentioned J.K. Rowling specifically, and I think it's part of, and J.K. Rowling has said that Edith Nesbitt was an influence on her. And I think one of the ways that you can see that is that in the Harry Potter stories, those are very much grounded in a muggle world. You know, there is the muggle world, which we are all a part of. We go into the wizarding world with Harry, but the repercussions and the problems and the real life that Harry consistently goes back to with the Dursleys that real life is a, a tough one. It is not pleasant. It is not fun. It is not cute. It is not cutesy. I mean, it can be funny because of the way the parents treat Dudley. And certainly, you couldn't have asked for finer actors being cast as the Dursleys with uh, Richard Griffiths playing Vernon, Uncle Vernon, and Fiona Shaw was Aunt Petunia. And you should know, I mean, Richard Griffiths, of course, had an incredible career in everything he showed up in. I think he was marvelous at Fiona Shaw is probably less known by you because she's an actress on stage more often than on screen. And the parts she usually does are nothing like Aunt Petunia. Her Medea, just woof. She is not frivolous. She is not silly. She is not whiny. She's just an incredible actress. Anyway, that grounding in reality is something that Edith Nesbitt really started when it comes to children's books. And so I have a story for you today that is really quite grounded in reality. 
it is, as I said, not necessarily a happy reality. However, it is also not a Dickensian poor Joe in Bleak House or Pip's messed up relationship with Estella or Mrs. Haversham. It's none of that. It is simply a fairly realistic story. Now, for Americans, you have probably not made a Christmas pudding before. And in fact, you may have been kind of confused by Christmas puddings as described in Charles Dickens. These were cakes, incredibly dense cakes. If you think of a Claxton, Georgia fruit cake, you're getting close. It's a very dense cake. It's got lots of stuff in it. And to, to cook it, pro- because it's so dense, to cook it properly, it must be steamed. It is often drenched in alcohol, which sounds a little weird to us now. But if you think back to when these puddings, they're, they're called puddings in the UK and in the States, we tend to call these cakes, or we call them something odd drenched in alcohol. When, when they were made a long, long time ago, the alcohol was an incredibly good preservative. And if you were going to spend the amount of money that you would have to spend to make this kind of dense, fruit-rich cake, dried fruit, candied fruit. If you're going to spend all that money, you, A, aren't going to be able to eat this thing all in one sitting, and B, you don't want it to go bad because you just spent a ton of money on it and time. So there will be wide and varying discussions about Christmas puddings because this story is in fact called a conscience pudding. This is a long story, so this is going to be what we listen to today. And I'm going to put some extra links in the show notes. I haven't done that a whole lot, but as is the way with Craftlet, once I start researching this stuff, I tend to get interested and excited by a bunch of other things. So I'm going to link out to some other stories and books, some of them from Craftlet, some of them audiobooks, some of them just book books that you might find interesting if, uh, if you like Nesbitt's writing. She is as I said, an oddly modern writer. She was born in 1858, and she died in the 20s. So so just keep that in mind as you're listening. And so that is it. That is our day eight. Are you ready? Let's go listen. Here you go. The Conscience Pudding by E. Nesbitt Read by Corrie Samuel The Conscience Pudding From The New Treasure Seekers by E. Nesbitt It was Christmas, nearly a year after Mother died. I cannot write about Mother, but I will just say one thing. If she had only been away for a little while, and not for always, we shouldn't have been so keen on having a Christmas. I didn't understand this then, but I am much older now, and I think it was just because everything was so different and horrid we felt we must do something, and perhaps we were not particular enough what— Things make you much more unhappy when you loaf about than when you are doing events. Father had to go away just about Christmas. He had heard that his wicked partner, who ran away with his money, was in France, and he thought he could catch him, but really he was in Spain, where catching criminals is never practised. We did not know this till afterwards. Before Father went away, he took Dora and Oswald into his study, and said, "'I'm awfully sorry I've got to go away.' "'but it is very serious business, and I must go. "'You'll be good while I'm away, kiddies, won't you?' "'We promised faithfully. "'Then he said, "'There are reasons. "'You wouldn't understand if I tried to tell you, "'but you can't have much for Christmas this year. "'But I've told Matilda to make you a good plain pudding. "'Perhaps next Christmas will be brighter.' "'It was, for the next Christmas saw us "'the affluent nephews and nieces of an Indian uncle.' but that is quite another story, as good old Kipling says. When father had been seen off at Lewisham Station with his bags and a plaid rug in a strap, we came home again, and it was horrid. There were papers and things littered all over his room where he had packed. We tidied the room up. It was the only thing we could do for him. It was Dicky who accidentally broke his shaving glass, and H.O. made a paper boat out of a letter we found out afterwards father particularly wanted to keep. This took us some time, and when we went into the nursery, the fire was black out, and we could not get it alight again, even with the whole daily chronicle. Matilda, who was our general then, was out, as well as the fire, so we went and sat in the kitchen. There is always a good fire in kitchens. 
The kitchen hearth rug was not nice to sit on, so we spread newspapers on it. It was sitting in the kitchen, I think, that brought to our minds my father's parting words, about the pudding, I mean. Oswald said, Father said we couldn't have much for Christmas for secret reasons, and he said he had told Matilda to make us a plain pudding. The plain pudding instantly cast its shadow over the deepening gloom of our young minds. I wonder how plain she'll make it, Dicky said. As plain as plain you may depend, said Oswald. A uh, here am I, where are you, pudding? That's her sort. The others groaned, and we gathered closer round the fire till the newspapers rustled madly. I believe I could make a pudding that wasn't plain, if I tried, Alice said. Why shouldn't we? No chink, said Oswald, with brief sadness. How much would it cost? Noel asked, and added that Dora had twopence, and H.O. had a French halfpenny. Dora got the cookery book out of the dresser drawer, where it lay doubled up among clothes pegs, dirty dusters, scallop shells, string, penny novelettes, and the dining-room corkscrew. The general we had then, it seemed as if she did all the cooking on the cookery book instead of on the baking board. There were traces of so many bygone meals upon its pages. It doesn't say Christmas pudding at all, said Dora. Try plum, the resourceful Oswald instantly counselled. Dora turned the greasy pages anxiously. Plum pudding, 518. A rich with flour, 517. Christmas, 517. Cold brandy sauce for 241. We shouldn't care about that, so it's no use looking. Good without eggs, 518. Plain, 518. We don't want that, anyhow. Christmas, 517, that's the one. It took her a long time to find the page. Oswald got a shovel of coals and made up the fire. It blazed up like the devouring elephant the Daily Telegraph always calls it. Then Dora read, Christmas plum pudding, time six hours. To eat it in, said H.O. No, silly, to make it. Forge your head, Dora, Dicky replied. Dora went on. Twenty seventy two. One pound and a half of raisins, half a pound of currants, three quarters of a pound of bread crumbs, half a pound of flour, three quarters of a pound of beef suet, nine eggs. One wine glass full of brandy, half a pound of citron and orange peel, half a nutmeg, and a little ground ginger. I wonder how little ground ginger. A teacupful would be enough, I think, Alice said. We must not be extravagant. We haven't got anything yet to be extravagant with, said Oswald, who had toothache that day. What would you do with the things if you got them? You'd chop the suet as fine as possible. I wonder how fine that is replied Dora, and the book together, and mix it with the bread-crumbs and flour, add the currants washed and dried. Not starched, then, said Alice. The citron and orange peel cut into thin slices. I wonder what they call thin. Matilda's thin bread and butter is quite different from what I mean by it. And the raisins, stoned and divided. How many heaps would you divide them into? Seven, I suppose, said Alice. One for each person, and one for the pot. I mean pudding. Mix it all well together with the grated nutmeg and ginger. Then stir in nine eggs well beaten, and the brandy. We'll leave that out, I think. And again mix it thoroughly together, that every ingredient may be moistened. Put it into a buttered mould, tie over tightly, and boil for six hours. Serve it ornamented with holly and brandy poured over it. I should think holly and brandy poured over it would be simply beastly, said Dicky. I expect the book knows. I dare say holly and water would do as well, though. This pudding may be made a month before. It's no use reading about that, though, because we've only got four days to Christmas. It's no use reading about any of it, said Oswald, with thoughtful repeatedness, because we haven't got the things and we haven't got the coin to get them. We might get the tin somehow, said Dicky. There must be lots of kind people who would subscribe to a Christmas pudding for poor children who hadn't any, Noel said. Well, I'm going skating at Penn's, said Oswald. It's no use thinking about puddings. We must put up with it plain. So he went, and Dicky went with him. 
When they returned to their home in the evening, the fire had been lighted again in the nursery, and the others were just having tea. We toasted our bread and butter on the bare side, and it gets a little warm among the butter. This is called a French toast. I like English better, but it is more expensive, Alice said. Matilda is in a frightful rage about your putting those coals on the kitchen fire, Oswald. She says we shan't have enough to last over Christmas as it is. And father gave her a talking to before he went about them. Asked her if she ate them, she says, but I don't believe he did. Anyway, she's locked the coal cellar door, and she's got the key in her pocket. I don't see how we can boil the pudding. What pudding? said Oswald dreamily. He was thinking of a chap he had seen at Penn's, who had cut the date eighteen ninety nine on the ice with four strokes. The pudding, Alice said. Oh, we've had such a time, Oswald. First Dora and I went to the shops to find out exactly what the pudding would cost. It's only two and eleven pence halfpenny, counting in the holly. It's no good, Oswald repeated. He is very patient and will say the same thing any number of times. It's no good. You know we've got no tin. Ah, said Alice. But H. O. and I went out, and we called at some of the houses in Granville Park and Dartmouth Hill. And we got a lot of sixpences and shillings, besides pennies, and one old gentleman gave us half a crown. He was so nice, quite bald, with a knitted red and blue waistcoat. We've got eight and sevenpence. Oswald did not feel quite sure father would like us to go asking for shillings and sixpences, or even half crowns from strangers, but he did not say so. The money had been asked for and got, and it couldn't be helped, and perhaps he wanted the pudding. I am not able to remember exactly why he did not speak up and say, "This is wrong," but anyway he didn't. Alice and Dora went out and bought the things next morning. They bought double quantities, so that it came to five shillings and eleven pence, and was enough to make a noble pudding. There was a lot of holly left over for decorations. We used very little for the sauce. The money that was left we spent very anxiously in other things to eat, such as dates and figs and toffee. We did not tell Matilda about it. She was a red-haired girl and apt to turn shirty at the least thing. Concealed under our jackets and overcoats, we carried the parcels up to the nursery and hid them in the treasure chest we had there. It was the bureau drawer. It was locked up afterwards because the treacle got all over the green baize and the little drawers inside it while we were waiting to begin to make the pudding. It was the grocer told us we ought to put treacle in the pudding. And also about not so much ginger as a teacupful. When Matilda had begun to pretend to scrub the floor, she pretended this three times a week so as to have an excuse not to let us in the kitchen. But I know she used to read novelettes most of the time because Alice and I had a squint through the window more than once. We barricaded the nursery door and set to work. We were very careful to be quite clean. We washed our hands as well as the currants. I have sometimes thought. We did not get all the soap off the currants. The pudding smelt like a washing day when the time came to cut it open, and we washed a corner of the table to chop the suet on. Chopping suet looks easy till you try. Father's machine he weighs letters with did to weigh out the things. We did this very carefully in case the grocer had not done so. Everything was right except the raisins. H O had carried them home. He was very young then, and there was a hole in the corner of the paper bag. And his mouth was sticky. Lots of people have been hanged to a gibbet in chains on evidence no worse than that, and we told H O so till he cried. This was good for him. It was not unkindness to H O, but part of our duty. Chopping suet as fine as possible is much harder than any one would think, as I said before. So is crumbling bread, especially if your loaf is new like ours was. When we had done them, the bread crumbs and the suet were both very large and lumpy. And of a dingy grey colour, something like pale slate pencil. They looked a better colour when we had mixed them with the flour. The girls had washed the currants with brown Windsor soap and the sponge. Some of the currants got inside the sponge and kept coming out in the bath for days afterwards. I see now that this was not quite nice. We cut the candied peel as thin as we wish people would cut our bread and butter. We tried to take the stones out of the raisins, but they were too sticky. So we just divided them up in seven lots. Then we mixed the other things in the wash hand basin from the spare bedroom that was always spare. We each put in our own lot of raisins and turned it all into a pudding basin 
and tied it up in one of Alice's pinafores, which was the nearest thing to a proper pudding cloth we could find, at any rate clean. What was left sticking to the wash hand basin did not taste so bad. It's a little bit soapy, Alice said, but perhaps that will boil out like stains in tablecloths. It was a difficult question how to boil the pudding. Matilda proved furious when asked to let us, just because someone had happened to knock her hat off the scullery door, and Pincher had got it and done for it. However, part of the embassy nicked a saucepan, while the others were being told what Matilda thought about the hat, and we got hot water out of the bathroom and made it boil over our nursery fire. We put the pudding in it. It was now getting on towards the hour of tea, and let it boil. With some exceptions, owing to the fire going down, and Matilda not hurrying up with coals, it boiled for an hour and a quarter. Then Matilda came suddenly in and said, I'm not going to have you messing about in here with my saucepans, and she tried to take it off the fire. You will see that we couldn't stand this. It was not likely. I do not remember who it was that told her to mind her own business, and I think I have forgotten who caught hold of her first to make her chuck it. I'm sure no needless violence was used. Anyway, while the struggle progressed, Alice and Dora took the saucepan away and put it in the boot cupboard under the stairs and put the key in their pocket. This sharp encounter made everyone very hot and cross. We got over it before Matilda did, but we brought her round before bedtime. Quarrels should always be made up before bedtime. It says so in the Bible. If this simple rule was followed, there would not be so many wars and martyrs and lawsuits and inquisitions and bloody deaths at the stake. All the house was still. The gas was out all over the house, except on the first landing, when several darkly shrouded figures might have been observed creeping downstairs to the kitchen. On the way, with superior precaution, we got out our saucepan. The kitchen fire was red, but low. The coal cellar was locked, and there was nothing in the scuttle but a little coal dust, and the piece of brown paper that is put in to keep the coals from tumbling out through the bottom where the hole is. We put the saucepan on the fire and plied it with fuel. Two chronicles, a telegraph, and two family herald novelettes were burned in vain. I am almost sure the pudding did not boil at all that night. Never mind, Alice said. We can each nick a piece of coal every time we go into the kitchen tomorrow. This daring scheme was faithfully performed, and by night we had nearly half a waste paper basket of coal, coke, and cinders. And in the depth of night once more we might have been observed, this time with our collier like waste paper basket in our guarded hands. There was more fire left in the grate that night, and we fed it with the fuel we had collected. This time the fire blazed up, and the pudding boiled like mad. This was the time it boiled two hours. At least I think it was about that, but we dropped to sleep on the kitchen tables and dresser. You dare not be lowly in the night in a kitchen because of the beetles. We were aroused by a horrible smell. It was the pudding cloth burning. All the water had secretly boiled itself away. We filled it up at once with cold, and the saucepan cracked. So we cleaned it and put it back on the shelf, and took another and went to bed. You see what a lot of trouble we had over the pudding. Every evening till Christmas, which had now become only the day after tomorrow, we sneaked down in the inky midnight and boiled that pudding for as long as it would. On Christmas morning we chopped the holly for the sauce, but we put hot water instead of brandy and moist sugar. Some of them said it was not so bad. Oswald was not one of these. Then came the moment when the plain pudding father had ordered smoked upon the board. Matilda brought it in, and went away at once. She had a cousin out of Woolwich Arsenal to see her that day, I remember. Those far-off days are quite distinct in memory's recollection still. Then we got out our own pudding from its hiding-place, and gave it one last hurried boil, only seven minutes, because of the general impatience which Oswald and Dora could not cope with. We had found means to secrete a dish, and we now tried to dish the pudding up, but it stuck to the basin and had to be dislodged with a chisel. The pudding was horribly pale. We poured the holly sauce over it, and Dora took up the knife and was just cutting it, when a few simple words from H.O. turned us from happy and triumphing cookery artists to persons in despair. He said, 
How pleased all those kind ladies and gentlemen would be if they knew we were the poor children they gave the shillings and sixpences and things for. We all said, What? It was no moment for politeness. I say, H.O. said, they'd be glad if they knew it was us was enjoying the pudding and not dirty little really poor children. You should say you were, not you was, said Dora, but it was as in a dream and only from habit. Do you mean to say, Oswald spoke firmly, yet not angrily, that you and Alice went and begged for money for poor children, and then kept it? We didn't keep it, said H.O. We spent it. We've kept the things, you little duffer, said Dicky, looking at the pudding sitting alone and uncared for on its dish. You begged for money for poor children, and then kept it. It's stealing, that's what it is. I don't say so much about you. You're only a silly kid. But Alice knew better. Why did you do it? He turned to Alice, but she was now too deep in tears to get a word out. H.O. looked a bit frightened, but he answered the question. We have taught him this. He said, I thought they'd give us more if I said poor children than if I said just us. That's cheating, said Dicky. Downright beastly mean low cheating. I'm not, said H.O., and you're another. Then he began to cry too. I do not know how the others felt, but I understand from Oswald that he felt that now the honour of the House of Bastable had been stamped on in the dust, and it didn't matter what happened. He looked at the beastly holly that had been left over from the sauce and was stuck up over the pictures. It now appeared hollow and disgusting, though it had got quite a lot of berries, and some of it was the varied kind, green and white. The figs and dates and toffee were set out in the doll's dinner service. The very sight of it all made Oswald blush sickly. He owns he would have liked to cuff H.O., and, if he did for a moment wish to shake Alice, the author for one can make allowances. Now Alice choked and spluttered, and wiped her eyes fiercely, and said, "'It's no use ragging H.O. It's my fault. I'm older than he is.' H.O. said, "'It couldn't be Alice's fault. I don't see as it was wrong.' "'That, not as,' murmured Dora, putting her arm round the sinner who had brought this degrading blight upon our family tree. But such is girls' undetermined and affectionate silliness. "'Tell sister all about it, H.O. dear. Why couldn't it be Alice's fault?' H.O. cuddled up to Dora, and said snufflingly in his nose, "'Because she hadn't got nothing to do with it. I collected it all. She never went into one of the houses. She didn't want to.' "'And then took all the credit of getting the money,' said Dicky savagely. Oswald said, "'Not much credit,' in scornful tones. "'Oh, you are beastly, the whole lot of you, except Dora,' Alice said, stamping her foot in rage and despair. I tore my frock on a nail going out, and I didn't want to go back, and I got H.O. to go to the houses alone, and I waited for him outside, and I asked him not to say anything, because I didn't want Dora to know about the frock. It's my best. And I don't know what he said inside. He never told me. But I'll bet anything he didn't mean to cheat. You said lots of kind people would be ready to give money to get pudding for poor children, so I asked them to. Oswald, with his strong right hand, "'waved a wave of passing things over. "'We'll talk about that another time,' he said. "'Just now we've got weightier things to deal with.' "'He pointed to the pudding, "'which had grown cold during the conversation to which I have alluded. "'H.O. stopped crying, but Alice went on with it. "'Oswald now said, "'We're a base and outcast family. "'Until that pudding's out of the house, "'we shan't be able to look anyone in the face.' We must see that that pudding goes to poor children, not grizzling, grumpy, whiny-piny, pretending poor children, but real poor ones, just as poor as they can stick. And the figs, too, and the dates, said Noel, with regretting tones. Every fig, said Dicky sternly. Oswald is quite right. This honourable resolution made us feel a bit better. We hastily put on our best things and washed ourselves a bit, and hurried out to find some really poor people to give the pudding to. We cut it in slices ready, and put it in a basket with the figs and dates and toffee. We would not let H.O. come with us at first, because he wanted to, 
and Alice would not come because of him, so at last we had to let him. The excitement of tearing into your best things heals the hurt that wounded honour feels, as the poetry writer said, or at any rate it makes the hurt feel better. We went out into the streets. They were pretty quiet. Nearly everybody was eating its Christmas dessert. But presently we met a woman in an apron. Oswald said very politely, Please, are you a poor person? And she told us to get along with us. The next we met was a shabby man with a hole in his left boot. Again Oswald said, Please, are you a poor person, and have you any poor little children? The man told us not to come any of our games with him, or we should laugh on the wrong side of our faces. We went on sadly. We had no heart to stop and explain to him that we had no games to come. The next was a young man near the obelisk. Dora tried this time. She said, Oh, if you please, we've got some Christmas pudding in this basket, and if you're a poor person, you can have some. Poor as Job, said the young man, in a hoarse voice, and he had to come up out of a red comforter to say it. We gave him a slice of the pudding, and he bit into it without thanks or delay. The next minute he had thrown the pudding slap in Dora's face, and was clutching Dicky by the collar. "'Blimey if I don't chuck you in the river, the whole blooming lot of you!' he exclaimed. The girls screamed, the boys shouted, and though Oswald threw himself on the insulter of his sister with all his manly vigour, yet but for a friend of Oswald's, who was in the police, passing at that instant, the author shudders to think what might have happened, for he was a strong young man, and Oswald is not yet come to his full strength, and the craggy runs all too near. Our policeman led our assailant aside, and we waited anxiously as he told us to. After long uncertain moments, the young man in the comforter loafed off grumbling, and our policeman turned to us. Said you give him a dollop of pudding and a taste of soap and hair oil. I suppose the hair oil must have been the brown winsoriness of the soap coming out. We were sorry, but it was still our duty to get rid of the pudding. The quaggy was handy, it is true, but when you have collected money to feed poor children and spent it on pudding, it is not right to throw that pudding in the river. People do not subscribe shillings and sixpences and half-crowns to feed a hungry flood with Christmas pudding. Yet we shrank from asking any more people whether they were poor persons, or about their families, and still more from offering the pudding to chance people who might bite into it and taste the soap before we had time to get away. It was Alice, the most paralysed with disgrace of all of us, who thought of the best idea. She said, Let's take it to the workhouse. At any rate, they're all poor there, and they mayn't go out without leave, so they can't run after us to do anything to us after the pudding. No one would give them leave to go out to pursue people who have brought them pudding and wreck vengeance on them, and at any rate, we shall get rid of the conscience pudding. It's a sort of conscience money, you know, only it isn't money but pudding. The workhouse is a good way, but we stuck to it, though very cold, and hungrier than we thought possible when we started for we had been so agitated, we had not even stayed to eat the plain pudding our good father had so kindly and thoughtfully ordered for our Christmas dinner. The big bell at the workhouse made a man open the door to us when we rang it. Oswald said, and he spoke, because he is next eldest to Dora, and she had had jolly well enough of saying anything about pudding. He said, Please, we've brought some pudding for the poor people. He looked us up and down, and he looked at our basket, then he said, You'd better see the matron. We waited in a hall, feeling more and more uncomfy, and less and less like Christmas. We were very cold indeed, especially our hands and our noses, and we felt less and less able to face the matron if she was horrid, and one of us at least wished we had chosen the quaggy for the pudding's long home, and made it up to the robbed poor in some other way afterwards. Just as Alice was saying earnestly, in the burning cold ear of Oswald, Let's put down the basket and make a bolt for it. Oh, Oswald, let's! A lady came along the passage. She was very upright, and she had eyes that went through you like blue gimlets. I should not like to be obliged to thwart that lady if she had any design and mine was opposite. I'm glad this is not likely to occur. She said, What's all this about a pudding? H.O. said at once, before we could stop him, They say I've stolen the pudding, so we've brought it here for the poor people. 
"'No, he didn't. That wasn't why. The money was given. It was meant for the poor. Shut up, H.O.' said the rest of us all at once. Then there was an awful silence. The lady gimleted us again one by one with her blue eyes. Then she said, "'Come into my room. You all look frozen.' She took us into a very jolly room with velvet curtains and a big fire, and the gas lighted, because now it was almost dark, even out of doors. She gave us chairs, and Oswald felt as if his was a dock, he felt so criminal, and the lady looked so judgular. Then she took the armchair by the fire herself, and said, "'Who's the eldest?' "'I am,' said Dora, looking more like a frightened white rabbit than I've ever seen her. "'Then tell me all about it.' Dora looked at Alice, and began to cry. That slab of pudding in the face had totally unnerved the gentle girl. Alice's eyes were red, and her face was puffy with crying, but she spoke up for Dora, and said, "'Oh, please let Oswald tell. Dora can't. She's tired with the long walk. And a young man threw a piece of it in her face, and—' The lady nodded, and Oswald began. He told the story from the very beginning, as he has always been taught to, though he hated to lay bare the family honour's wound before a stranger, however judge-like and gimlet-eyed. He told all, not concealing the pudding-throwing, nor what the young man had said about soap. So, he ended, we want to give the conscience pudding to you. It's like conscience money, you know what that is, don't you? But if you really think it is soapy, and not just the young man's horridness, perhaps you'd better not let them eat it. But the figs and things are all right. When he had done, the lady said, for most of us were crying, more or less, "'Come, cheer up. It's Christmas time, and he's very little, your brother, I mean, and I think the rest of you seem pretty well able to take care of the honour of the family. I'll take the conscience pudding off your minds. Where are you going now?' "'Home, I suppose,' Oswald said, and he thought how nasty and dark and dull it would be, the fire out, most likely, and farther away. "'And your father's not at home, you say?' "'The blue gimlet lady went on. "'What do you say to having tea with me, "'and then seeing the entertainment we have got up for our old people?' "'Then the lady smiled, and the blue gimlets looked quite merry. "'The room was so warm and comfortable, "'and the invitation was the last thing we expected. "'It was jolly of her, I do think. "'No one thought quite at first of saying how pleased we should be "'to accept her kind invitation.' Instead we all just said, "'Oh!' but in a tone which must have told her we meant, "'Yes, please,' very deeply. Oswald, this has more than once happened, was the first to restore his manners. He made a proper bow like he has been taught, and said, "'Thank you very much. We should like it very much. It is very much nicer than going home. Thank you very much.' I need not tell the reader that Oswald could have made up a much better speech if he had had more time to make it up in, or if he had not been so filled with mixed flusteredness and purification by the shameful events of the day. We washed our faces and hands, and had a first-rate muffin and crumpet tea with slices of cold meats and many nice jams and cakes. A lot of other people were there, most of them people who were giving the entertainment to the aged poor. After tea it was the entertainment. Songs, and conjuring, and a play called Box and Cox, very amusing, and a lot of throwing things about in it, bacon, and chops and things, and minstrels. We clapped till our hands were sore. When it was over we said good-bye. In between the songs and things, Oswald had had time to make up a speech of thanks to the lady. He said, We all thank you heartily for your goodness. The entertainment was beautiful. We shall never forget your kindness and hospitableness. The lady laughed, and said she had been very pleased to have us. A fat gentleman said, "'And your teas? I hope you enjoyed those, eh?' Oswald had not had time to make up an answer to that, so he answered straight from the heart, and said, "'Rather!' And everyone laughed, and slapped us boys on the back, and kissed the girls, and the gentleman who played the bones in the minstrel saw us home. We ate the cold pudding that night, and H.O. dreamed that something came to eat him, like it advises you to in the advertisements on the hoardings. The grown-up said it was the pudding, but I don't think it could have been that, because, as I have said more than once, it was so very plain. 
some of H.O.'s brothers and sisters thought it was a judgment on him for pretending about who the poor children were he was collecting the money for. Oswald does not believe such a little boy as H.O. would have a real judgment made just for him and nobody else, whatever he did. But it certainly is odd. H.O. was the only one who had bad dreams, and he was also the only one who got any of the things we bought with that ill-gotten money, because, you remember, he picked a hole in the raisin paper as he was bringing the parcel home. The rest of us had nothing, unless you count the scrapings of the pudding basin, and those don't really count at all. End of The Conscience Pudding by E. Nesbitt Low How a Rose Air Blooming, sung by Mark Smith and Laurie Ann Walden.